On today's episode of A Measure of Faith, we're going to talk about what it means to truly follow Christ. Jesus said that if any man follow me, let him take up his cross and deny himself. What does that mean? Do we need to also die a literal death? We're going to explore this topic and more in today's episode of A Measure of Faith. If you've ever asked yourself, is God real? Is there more to life? Are miracles possible? Then you're in the right place. Thank you for joining us today on this podcast. Here's your host, Jacob Jones, pastor of River City Pentecostals in Decatur, Alabama, hoping to increase your measure of faith with inspirational stories and the truth of God's word. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That's from Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 in the Christian Standard Bible. And my question to you today is this. What is the gospel truth? If someone asks you to explain the gospel, could you do it? The word gospel simply means the good news. But what is the good news? Perhaps the best place to find the answer to this question is in the first letter to the Corinthian church that Paul wrote where he explains what the good news is exactly in detail. He tells us about how Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and then was resurrected. That truly is good news. That's great news. Paul goes on to say that Jesus was seen by many witnesses after his resurrection. He teaches that because Christ rose again, we too shall also rise again. This is all Good news. Once you believe in the gospel, though, you're compelled to respond. It isn't enough to just hear the gospel and then continue down the same path that you were heading down before you heard this good news. It's not ordinary news. It's life-altering news. Don't take my word for it. Look at Matthew 16, 24. We just read it. You've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. How how can I follow Jesus? Do I have to die? Do I have to also be buried and rise again? Jesus plainly tells us if we want to follow him, we've got to deny ourselves and take up our cross, not his cross. He's not going to take up our cross. We have to take up our cross just like Jesus took up his cross. In this Bible study that I will do in multiple series, uh, it's going to be several episodes long. This is the first episode of this Bible study in particular called Follow Him. It's a Bible study that I wrote, and I'm going to show you how to follow Jesus through four major intersections in the life of Jesus. And today, we're going to start with his birth. Jesus doesn't expect us to take up a physical cross and die a physical death in order to follow him. This is a spiritual thing. There are many followers of Jesus that are followers in name only. They will acknowledge the gospel, but they do not take up their cross and follow him. Why not? Because to do so requires one to die to his old sinful life, to change and become more Christ-like, to deny your will and follow God's will. And many people are not willing to do this so they can talk the talk, but they don't want to walk the walk. So in these next four lessons, I'm going to show you how to truly, properly respond to and obey the gospel, not just hear it, not just believe it, but to respond to to the gospel and we'll find out what it truly means to follow him so this first lesson is about the birth but we're going to talk about his death his burial and his resurrection as well if we're going to follow him we're following him to the end we're going to start here with his birth and emulate the life of jesus each step of the way and we will find out what it truly means to take up our cross and live like Jesus. Now, before I start, I want to make a very important distinction between truth and tradition because it's it's very important to understand what the source for this Bible study is before we get any further. It may seem obvious that this Bible study source is the Bible. However, 
There are some Bible teachers that will intermingle traditions and customs and statements of faith and things that came from some council meeting. They will they will pull all those into their Bible teaching, but this Bible study will not do this. Whenever Scripture is in conflict with tradition, it's Scripture that will prevail. There's no creed, no statement of faith, no church bylaw, no prophecy, no sermon, no nothing that can overrule what the Bible says. Listen to Paul in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 through 9 he said i am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of christ and are turning to a different gospel not that there is another gospel but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of christ but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. I don't want to be a cursed preacher. You, you, you've heard cursed preachers, whether you know it or not, that are preaching a gospel that's contrary to the one that Paul preached. So we got to make sure we separate truth from tradition. I don't care how long you believed it, how long your grandfather believed it. If it contradicts the Bible, we don't want it. Another common mistake in particular when you're studying the Bible is to take one verse out of context. You may have heard someone say, oh, you're cherry picking that. And if you take something out of context without considering other scripture about that same subject, this is a huge error. For example, if in one verse it says that we need to love one another, and in another verse, in a totally different book of the Bible, it says you need to love God, then it would be wrong to teach people that you only need to love God and no one else. Do you see that mistake? It seems simple, right? But we hear this all the time from many teachers that make this mistake when it comes to salvation they'll read in one place where it says you need to believe in jesus to be saved but then totally disregard another place that says jesus said you need to believe and be baptized to be saved they'll 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 say well i, I like this one over here because it just says believe but they won't read the other one that says get baptized to teach salvation properly you've got to use both john three sixteen and John 3 and 5, and Mark 16, 16, and Acts chapter 2, verse 30. You've got to pull all the scriptures that are talking about salvation together. God wrote the Bible this way on purpose so that nobody could just rip one page out and destroy his gospel. He's got it intermingled throughout all the chapters and, and verses of the Bible. You can't get rid of his word because he's got it set up in such a way that you, you can't do it. It's impossible. So to to reverse engineer that, you can't just go to one scripture and say, this is my gospel. No, you've, you've got to put everything together. So let's get into this first lesson. In this first lesson, we're talking about the birth. So let's start with the beginning of Jesus's life. And this Christmas season is coming up and almost 2000 years ago. Jesus was born miraculously to a virgin named Mary. Now, I know there's some debate on whether or not that was on December 25th, and that that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what day it was. We do know that it was 2,000 years ago. So if you're hearing this, then I suspect that you were at one point born as well. I mean, you can't hear this podcast if you weren't born someday. You probably celebrate that birthday every year. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about another kind of birth, though. This birth is not a natural birth. It's a spiritual one. You may also hear this referred to by some as the new birth or as being born again. What is this new birth? Is it required? How is it accomplished? I'm going to answer these questions and more in this first lesson. Make no, make no mistake about it. These are some of the most important questions you could ever ask. Now, if you don't have your Bible, this would be a good time to grab it. Unless you're driving, then just listen along and trust me and go back and look at this later in John chapter 3. But if you are at a place where you're sitting and you can sit down and grab your Bible, pause this if you need to, go grab it, turn to John chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1 and we're going to read along. 
a story about Jesus talking to a Pharisee in the middle of the night. It says in verse 1 of chapter 3, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So, notice when Jesus first talks to Nicodemus about being born again, that Nicodemus is a little bit confused. I, I don't blame him. Being born again was a novel concept. It had never been talked about before until this point. So it's not difficult to see how Nicodemus might think Jesus is referring to natural birth. That was the only kind of birth that there was up to this point. So Nicodemus asked a very natural question. He's like, how, how can I be born again? Do I go into my mother's womb a second time? This, this is a clear indication that he was thinking about a natural birth and not a spiritual one. But Jesus responds to him to clarify this in verse 5 and 6 to say, no, I'm talking about a spiritual birth. You must be born of the water and the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. <clears throat> so why do we need to be born again? That's, that's the first question we're going to ask. Jesus said we must be born again of water and spirit. So the first question is, why? And the reason why is, well, our natural birth, it came from Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman. Way back in the book of Genesis, you'll find that Adam and Eve committed the first sin in paradise when they ate the forbidden fruit. A result of that sin was a set of curses. The man, woman, earth, and the serpent, they were all cursed. Every person born since that time has been subjected to this, these curses. Every person, that is, except for Jesus. David said it best this way in Psalm 51, 5. He said, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. The Garden of Eden was a perfect place with everything that Adam and Eve needed. They, they were allowed to eat of every tree in the garden, every tree except for one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It would have been simple for God to just not create that tree. But if he didn't create the tree, why would he create man? Because a man has no free will if he doesn't have that tree. And a man with no free will is almost the same as an angel. That's just that's kind of my idea is that, you know, God already had angels worshiping him. They had no choice. He but man was going to be different. God longed for a relationship with someone. And since relationships are built on choice, God created you and I with free will. He also created us to desire relationships just like he does. We are made in his image. But you can't force relationships to happen. It has to be mutual or it's not a relationship at all. That's why the tree had to be there. The tree was mankind's other choice. And notice how God gave them all kinds of other trees. He made it easy. And still with that one simple choice that said, here's one other choice besides me. Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, gave it to Adam. Their eyes were open. They no longer were innocent. They, they lost their innocence. They lost their immortality. They served, They severed their relationship with their creator. But fortunately, God made a way for us to regain all that was lost if we follow him. So let's look at three things that were lost in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. First, they lost their innocence because they instantly knew that they were naked. 
Second, they lost their immortality. They no longer live forever. And third, and most importantly, they lost a relationship with God. They had to leave the garden and the presence of God. The first thing that Adam and Eve lost was innocence because of their sin. Eating the forbidden fruit was a blatant act of rebellion against God and a deliberate act of disobedience. This is called sin. When sin entered this world, Adam and Eve lost their innocence and all mankind inherited the curse of sin. And as a result, no person except Jesus has ever lived without sin. Romans 6 or sorry, Romans 3:23 says, "For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God." Anyone who decides to follow Jesus Christ must first understand that they are a sinner. We're all sinners. We can find some comfort in knowing that we are not alone in this. Don't get mad if if you realize, "Oh, someone's trying to call me a sinner." No, we're all sinners. The person who says that you have sin, they've got sin too. Every person on earth is a sinner and we have all fallen short of God's glory. We have all tasted the forbidden fruit. Once you accept that you have a sin issue, the next step is taking care of that issue. And the Bible tells us that sin comes at a cost. And the second thing that Adam and Eve lost was their immortality when they sinned. And likewise, every time we sin... We deserve death. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a cost that no one can actually pay. If you had to die every time that you sin, you wouldn't be here. No one would. But thankfully, there is one that could pay the price for us. Jesus Christ. He died for our sins on the cross. The third thing that Adam and Eve lost in the garden was their relationship with God. The Bible tells us that God walked with Adam in the garden often, yet after Adam sinned, God came looking for Adam and couldn't find him. How is this possible? God is all-knowing, he's omnipresent. How did he lose Adam? Well, when Adam sinned, he completely severed his relationship with God, and likewise, when we sin, we're no longer connected to God either. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? Romans 8.6 says, Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God, because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is perhaps the greatest thing that mankind lost. Of all the things that we lost, this was the whole reason for our creation, to be in a relationship with our Creator. And if you want this back, you must follow Jesus. The gate is straight and the road is narrow, but I promise you the destination is worth it. Now that we've fully explored the natural birth from Adam and the sin that came with it, let's dive deeper into the new birth, that spiritual birth that Jesus was talking about. And for this, we got to go back to that story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You see, according to Jesus, to be born again a second time, you must be born of the water and the spirit. This is so important that Jesus uses the word must in verse 7. He also says that if you want to see or even enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again in verse 3 and verse 5. Being born again is not optional. Jesus said we must. Being born again requires water and spirit. What does that mean? Let's take a look at what else Jesus says on this topic. A few chapters later, We will see how the disciples executed this teaching. In John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus said, The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. And then John said, he said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not been given 
because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So Jesus tells the disciples that after he is glorified, and we'll look at what that means, he says the disciples will be able to experience rivers of living water, which John says, in retrospect, he he now knows, or in hindsight, he now knows what Jesus meant. John says when he was talking about the rivers of living water, he's referring to the Holy Spirit. This experience could not happen, though, until Jesus was glorified. Jesus was glorified when he ascended to heaven after his resurrection, meaning he received a glorified body, one that is no longer subject to death and decay from age or disease. The Bible teaches us that one day we will also have a glorified body when we get to heaven. And to fully understand what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 7, verse 38 that we just read, we need to see what his instructions to the disciples were right before he was glorified. Let's look at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 12 real quick. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, that's when he was glorified, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? They still thought he was talking about something natural. Verse 7, And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel which also said ye men of galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner as you have seen him go to heaven so in verse 4 Jesus promised the disciples that they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost in a few days. They stood and watched Jesus ascend to heaven, and they were commanded by two angels to go to Jerusalem, just like Jesus told them to do in verse 4. So they did that. They went to Jerusalem, and they waited about 10 days. Then, just as Jesus promised, the Holy Ghost came after he was glorified. Remember John said when he talked about living water, he was talking about the Holy Spirit, but that couldn't come until after Jesus was glorified. So Jesus is now glorified. He tells them to go wait in Jerusalem. An angel has to remind them, hey, quit staring up into heaven. Go do what he said. Go to Jerusalem. And here's what they did after they elected uh, someone to replace Judas at the end of chapter 1. We pick up in chapter 2, and it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, when Jesus was crucified, the Holy Spirit fell on 120 people who were praying in an upper room and waiting for Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit to come. So the Holy Spirit fell on them, and the Bible says that they spoke in languages that they could not have learned, and it was the Spirit of God that gave them that ability. 
This is often referred to as speaking in tongues, and we're going to talk more about that in a later episode. But the important thing to recognize is that everything happened just like Jesus said it would. The Holy Spirit came after Jesus was glorified. And when the Holy Spirit fell, a crowd started gathering. They started questioning what's happening. And the Bible says that Peter stood up and preached a message about Jesus. He first explains to them, What they were seeing and hearing was a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, in which God said, way back in the Old Testament, he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Peter confirms this is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Then he began to preach the gospel. We know he preached the gospel because he's telling the same things that we heard in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 at the beginning of this lesson when he's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He told people how Jesus came, how he did miracles, how he was crucified, how he was buried, how he was resurrected three days later from the death. He told them that Jesus was the son of an heir of David, King David, and that God had made Jesus both Lord and Christ. And Christ is a Greek word here meaning anointed one. It's the same word that the Hebrew word Messiah, the Messiah. Messiah means the same thing, the anointed one. And the Jews had been waiting for the Messiah, or in Greek, the Christ, for hundreds of years. So you can imagine the devastation they must have felt when Peter told them not only was Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, the one they had been waiting for for hundreds of years, but they crucified him. Hey guys, Jesus was the Messiah and you you killed him. Let's read what happens after Paul. I won't read the whole sermon. I, I just kind of summarize what Peter said. He preached the gospel. And at the very end of that gospel message, remember I told you when you hear the gospel, it requires a response. Listen to their response in Acts chapter 2 verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That word there, pricked in their hearts, could also be translated pierced to the heart. They were pierced in their heart. They felt some, If you're not pierced to your heart when you hear the gospel, you didn't hear the gospel that I heard about how a Savior came and died for you, how he shed his blood for you, how he took stripes on his back, how he hung on that cross for you to pay for the sin that you committed. When they heard that, they were pierced in their heart. And then they asked Peter, What shall we do? Remember, the gospel requires a response. You can't just hear about Jesus, how he died for your sins, and just believe in that truth and simply acknowledge in your mind that it's a great story. You need to ask the question, what should I do with this information? It should move you to a response. So many people say, well, just believe that it happened. No, what should I do? He didn't say, What shall I ask or what shall I believe or what shall I say or where shall I go? They asked him, what shall we do? Not what shall we think? What shall we imagine? What shall we what shall we do? Now, at this point in time, the disciples had the full authority from God to say anything in response to that question. They were given the keys to the kingdom. Peter, he could have said anything. He could have said, simply believe what I've told you. He could have said, repeat this prayer after me, this sinner's prayer. He didn't say any. He he could have said, raise your hand and acknowledge that Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior. That's not what he said. All of those are good things, but it wasn't what Peter said to do. When they heard the gospel and they were pricked in their heart and they said, what shall we do? Here was Peter's response in verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In short, Peter said the proper response to hearing the gospel is that you should, number one, repent. 
Number two, be baptized in Jesus' name. And number three, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Two elements from John chapter 3, verse 5 were water and spirit. Jesus said, if you're not born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter heaven. Peter then preached that everyone needed to be baptized in water and filled with the spirit once you hear the gospel and repent. Some will say this experience in Acts chapter 2 was not for everyone, but I beg to differ. If you... if you simply read the very next verse, you'll you'll see that that's a lie because Peter said after uh, after he told them to repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost, he said in verse thirty nine, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day. There were added unto them about 3,000 souls. It wasn't just for those people listening. He said it was for their children. He said it for all them that are far off. It wasn't limited to any generation or location. It, It was for anybody that the Lord our God would call. To truly follow him, we must experience the new birth. And the new birth is not a natural birth. It's being born of the water and the spirit. And if you follow it through scripture, the way that it was played out in scripture is to be baptized in Jesus name. That means to be fully immersed in water, which we'll talk about in a later episode. And also to be filled with his spirit, which we will also talk about exactly. We're going to dive into exactly what these mean because I don't want there to be any confusion. This this is Bible. I'm not reading to you from anything but the Word of God. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everyone, not just some. So, before we are reborn, we've got to first die. And I know that may sound scary, but we're not talking about a natural death here. Just like we weren't talking about a natural birth earlier in this lesson. But in the next lesson, we will discuss how we are required to die to our sins when we dive deeper into the subject of repentance. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I really do hope that it's touched somebody today. And if you have any questions or comments or whatever, you can see my email address in this podcast uh, show notes. Join me again on the next episode of A Measure of Faith.